Welcome to our discussion on quadratic functions, better known as parabolas, or the horseshoe-shaped functions. These are the objectives, right? We're going to find the vertex. We're going to determine if that vertex is a max or a min. We're going to find the zeros of the quadratic, uh, both on the x and y axes. We're going to figure out how to graph these functions and find the average rate of change of the function over a certain interval. So what is a parabola? Well, like I said, it's this horseshoe-shaped function. Um, it's the more commonly used uh, name of a quadratic function, which is any function of this form, ax squared plus bx plus c, um, where a, b, and c are constants. a cannot be zero, because if this zero is out, then you're just left with bx plus c, which is just a straight line, right? To graph this function, um, you either need to use a graphing utility or you need to know some basics about, um, you know, how these uh, letters influence uh, how it looks. But it's a very distinct function, right? You've seen them all before. Anytime you see these horseshoe things, that's a parabola. So we start with the most basic of them, which is just y equals x squared. And that's our parabola that is centered at 0, 0, right? So the vertex is right there at 0, 0. And it's symmetrical around the y-axis, right? So if you cut it in half, these two halves look exactly the same. And then we can, from that, we can augment it. We can uh, stretch it. We can compress it. We can shift it. We can flip it, right? We can do all these trans transformations to it to get other ones. So this one has been flipped vertically. And that's what the negative in front of it does, is it flips it vertically. So now it points down. And then because this constant is between 0 and 1, right? It's a fraction smaller than 1. It grows slower, which means it looks wider. It's, it's almost like we've, we've stretched it horizontally, right? You've pulled it horizontally. Okay, finding the vertex of a parabola is actually really easy. And it doesn't have to be, you know, ax squared. That's a pretty easy parabola. If we have ax squared, we know the vertex is always going to be at the origin. So the vertex um, you know, will always be the point 0, 0. Now the vertex is just talking about that part on the curve that is either the minimum or the maximum, right? It's kind of in this function, it's decreasing to this point, and it stops decreasing, and it starts increasing, right? It's where it changes directions. Here, it's increasing, it stops, and starts to decrease. So that's where you get a, either a minimum or a maximum. So that's what the vertex is. That's why it's an important um, point to find, because it gives us the minimum or the maximum of our function. Now, we know that if this constant, this a in front of the x squared term, doesn't matter what the rest of the stuff is, right? So it doesn't matter what the b in front of the x is or the c, right? Because remember, it's more normally ax squared plus bx plus c. It doesn't matter what those other two letters are. We only concern ourselves with the a. We only concern ourselves with the coefficient in front of the x squared, which is also called the leading coefficient, by the way. We're only concerned with that. And if that leading coefficient is less than zero, i.e. it's a negative number, then we know that the parabola opens down like this one on the right. And therefore, the vertex is going to be a maximum. However, if the a, right, if the constant in front of the x squared term, if that leading coefficient is greater than 0, i.e. a positive number, and in the case of this one, it's a positive 1, right, then it opens up for any positive number. And therefore, the vertex becomes a minimum. So it's really easy to figure out if the vertex is going to be a minimum or a maximum by the leading coefficient. Finding the actual value of the vertex is also fairly easy. And it depends on how the function is described to us, how it's given to us. And it, um, it makes it easier or a little bit more difficult, but it's still pretty easy with a simple little formula. Now, if they give you uh, a quadratic in this form. So you've got x plus or minus some number, and that whole quantity is being squared, and then you have plus or minus some other number. The, the generic form of this is uh, y equals x minus h quantity squared plus k, h and k. When it's in that form, the vertex always equals the point h comma k. And you can see in this form, 
h equals 2, because remember it's x minus h, so since it's x minus 2, it's 2, and then it's minus 1, so plus k, right, k has to be negative 1 to give us a minus 1 here, and that's why our vertex is 2, negative 1. So that's a nice, easy, you know, thing to know, but it only helps us if we're given our, our parabola in this form. It's not a very common form to see a, a quadratic function. So when we're given it in other forms, we have to, you know, figure out what the heck we actually have. So now, when we've got it in this form, right, again, it's still, it's the form that we, we know. So x minus h means that h is negative 1, and then plus k, so k is 2. So it still works. It doesn't matter if we put a constant out in front of here that's, you know, uh, positive or negative. doesn't matter what it is. The positive, func the positive number that we had before, the 1, tells us that, that vertex is a minimum. And then now that we have the negative number, that just tells us that the vertex is going to be a maximum because it opens down. But like I said, we don't always um, have it given to us in that um, you know, convenient form. The more common form that we see a parabola is ax squared plus bx plus c. This is called standard form. Um, I think it's also called something else, but who cares? But anyhow, it's the most common way we see it. Now, when it's in this form, the vertex is really simple to find. It's simply just negative b over 2a. That gives us the x value. And then all you have to do is take that value and plug it into the function. That's what all this gobbledygook means. That means f of minus b over 2a. It just means take that number, plug it into the f function, right? Plug it into the function and spit out the answer. And that gives you the y value. So it's minus b over 2a and then the function evaluated at that number. Really, really super easy. So let's look at a simple example. With this one, we can see that, right, A is 2. It's greater than 0, so we know it opens up, so we know it's going to be a minimum. Our B is negative 4, and our C is 4. we got to do minus B over 2A. So that minus the minus 4 gives us a plus 4. And then 2 times A, so we get 4 over 4, and that's what we get 1. Then you take 1 and plug it into this function, right? Which is 2 times 1 squared minus 4 times 1 plus 4. 1 squared is 1. 2 times 1 is 2, right? Minus 4 times 1, which is just minus 4. And then plus 4. These cancel, and you get a 2, right? So there's your 2. So here's your vertex, 1, 2. Okay? It's that simple, right? So all of that, you know f of minus b over 2a just means once you find the x value, once you do the minus b over 2a, which is a pretty simple thing to do, whatever that number is, simply plug it back into the function, and the answer that it spits out is the y value. That's the other piece of your ordered pair, the other piece of your vertex. Okay, let's move on to finding zeros. Well, to find zeros, the you know kind of what are called the true zeros of the functions, the ones that matters, i.e., when the the height of the function equals zero, when the output of the function equals zero, i.e., when it crosses the x-axis, so also called the x-intercepts, we find that with the quadratic formula. Very, it's a it's a very ugly looking formula, but it's a very easy formula to work with. Because again, you're just plugging some numbers in and doing some simple math, right? You're squaring some stuff, you're doing some multiplication, you're taking a square root, right? You're taking a division. The only confusing thing is this whole plus minus. That just means you have two different answers. You're going to take minus b and you're going to add this square root. Then you're going to divide by 2a. That's going to be one answer. Then you're going to come back and you're going to do minus b. You're going to subtract whatever this square root is, then divide by 2a that gives you the second answer, right? So that gives you two answers. Obviously, if b squared minus 4ac, if this just happens to work out to be zero, then you only get one answer because you get minus b plus zero and minus b minus zero, and it's the same darn thing, right? That's pretty rare. Also, of course, if b squared minus 4ac is a negative number, we can't take square roots of negative number, and then that tells us that there are no zeros, that the function never crosses the x-axis. So for instance, this equation, right, if we put this into the quadratic function, it's going to come back with a negative number underneath those that square root, and it's going to tell us, uh-oh, there are no zeros, i.e. it doesn't cross the x-axis anywhere. Now there is a zero for the y-axis, so to speak. It's not really a zero. It's just 
when x equals zero, we get a value for y. So it's a technical zero, but when we talk about the zeros of a function, it's usually when the function gives us an output, right? When it equals zero, not when we plug zero into the function. That's that's kind of a, a trivial zero. So we would find that one by just plugging zero into the function. Um, so if we were doing this one, of course, you plug in zero, this goes away, this goes away, and you can just get four, and you can see that's why it crosses at four. So that's how we find all the zeros. You use the quadratic formula, and then you plug zero in to find the uh, what's really the y-intercept, where it crosses the y-axis. All right, so those are all the zeros. The next thing is, how do we use those zeros to help us graph it? Well, you plug in those points. Uh, you, know, you, 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 you find the vertex, you, you plot that point. You find all the zeros, you plot those points. Based on whether or not A is positive or negative, you know that it opens either up or down, and then that tells you how to connect the points, and then there's your graph. Now, of course, if you've got a graphing calculator or any kind of graphing tool, you let it do the heavy lifting for you, and it does the graphing for you. What we're learning here is not how to graph something by hand. What we're learning is how these different aspects of the function give us information that we could use in order to graph the function. But it's really just more important to know that information, i.e. knowing that when A is positive, it opens up. Therefore, our vertex is a minimum, right? When A is negative, it opens down, which tells us the vertex is a maximum. That's really the more important thing. Graphing, you can always just use technology. So in this example, we want to graph this function the proper form or the you know the general form is to write it ax squared plus bx plus c. We know that a is negative 1. We know that b is 4. And we know that c is 0. Because it's a negative, right? We know that it opens downward. So when we find that vertex, we know it's going to be a maximum. We do our minus b over 2a, which gives us right negative 4, because that's minus b over 2 times negative 1. So negative 4 over negative 2 reduces to 2. We plug a 2 back in here which is 2 squared, and then you take the negative, right? It's not negative 2 squared. First you square, then you multiply it. So this is going to be 4, and then it's going to become negative 4. Negative 4 plus 8, that's why the answer is 4. So our vertex, right, is at 2 and 4. And we know that that vertex is a maximum because it opens down. Now to find the zeros, basically set it equal to zero and solve, this one's really easy because there's no constant. So if you set it equal to zero and solve, you can simply just factor out an x. And then we know that either this equals zero or this factor equals zero. So, you know, x equals zero or minus x plus four equals zero. And when you solve that, you get x equals four. So here's the two zeros. So if we plot all those, we know it crosses at zero. We know it crosses at four. We know the vertex is at 2, 4. We know it's a maximum. So we get that shape. And then, of course, technology would give us the same thing. So that's how we graph it. The last thing to talk about is the average rate of change. And the average rate of change of any function is simply just the slope of a straight line that connects two dots on the function, right? So if we're trying to find the average rate of change of a function between two inputs, those two inputs are two x values, all we have to do is find the slope of the line that connects the two dots on the graph. So pictorially, this is what we're doing, right? We want to know the average rate of change between A and B. So we go from A and we go up, okay, so here's the point on the graph. We go up from B to here, there's that point. We draw this line, and if we can find the slope of this line, that's the average rate of change. Because it's basically how much the function changed vertically over the x, right? The amount of kind of distance or time it took. So the change in the vertical divided by the change in the horizontal. That's slope, right? Change in y over change in x. That's just slope of a line. So that's all it is. It's really simple. You just take these two values, a and b, you plug them into the function to get their two values. That's just a big fancy way of saying Give me the answer when I plug B into it. Give me the answer when I plug A into it. Take the difference between those and then divide by the difference of B and A. Now, could you have done F of A minus F of B and, and A minus B? Absolutely, because remember, the slope is the same in either direction. It doesn't matter if you do B minus A or A minus B. You just have to be consistent, right? If we do F of A minus F of B, then on the bottom, we also have to do A minus B. 
We just normally do the one to the right minus the one to the left because then it gives us the difference as we move from left to right. But there's no rule that says you have to do that. That's just the way that we normally do it. So here's a real simple example. We want to know, right? So here's the revenue um, for a cruise, a quadratic function that uh, defines revenue. And um, X is the increase in the group size beyond 50 people. So X equals uh, 5 means that we, we have 55 people. So they want to know what is the average rate of change of revenue if the group increases from 50 to 55. Well, remember, X is, in this function, they defined X as the, the number of people beyond 50. So 50 is really what happens when X equals 0. So 55 is really what happens when X just equals 5. So that's why we're plugging in 0 and 5 and not 50 and 55. It's just the way the function is defined. So you take the function, you plug in 5. So you go back here and you plug in 5 and you do the math and you get 1,512 and 50 cents. You plug in 0, which of course is really easy because these things go away and you just get 1,500. And then you've got 5 minus 0. So you take this number minus that number, which gives us 1,250 divided by 5, two and a half dollars. So that means the average rate of change of revenue for those next five people is $2.50 per person. That's not really great, right? We're only adding an extra $2.50 for every extra person that goes on this cruise. Better be a pretty cheap cruise or you ain't making money. Okay, so graphically we can see that this is what the average is. It's the straight line that connects the dot 0, 1500 to the point 5, 15, 12, 50. And the slope of that line is going to be 2.5. So again, average rate of change is the slope of it's the slope of what we call a secant line. A secant line is just a fancy word for a line that connects two dots inside a function, right? So if you take two dots on a function, connect that line, that's a secant line. Or sorry, connect that those two dots, the line that you create is called a secant line. Who cares what it's called? You're basically just finding the slope of a line between the two dots on a function, and that's your average rate of change. And that's all I've got for you.